Thank you all so much for being here. My name is Mira Oreck. I'm with the Broadbent Institute. And I'm really grateful and appreciative to see so many people out on a Monday afternoon taking the time to talk politics. It's great to have so many, such a diverse group of people here. I want to welcome everyone both here and in this room. And for those of you watching on live stream across the country, we hope there are many of you and that you join us on Twitter. We'd like to acknowledge that this event is taking place on unceded Coast Salish territories. These are the traditional territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. <laughs> on behalf of the Broadbent Institute and the SFU School of Public Policy, I'm thrilled to welcome everyone here today to Beyond the Headlines, learning from the Alberta election. The Broadbent Institute is an independent, nonpartisan organization championing progressive change through the promotion of democracy, equality, and sustainability, and the training of a new generation of leaders. We are a national organization growing quickly with offices in Montreal, Toronto, Ottawa, and here in Vancouver. Please follow and like the Broadbent Institute and Press Progress on Facebook and Twitter. I'd like to acknowledge that there are two Broadbent Institute board members who have joined us today, Don Black and Patty Backus. <laughs> Along with some of our policy and leadership fellows, Reese Kesselman, Marie Delamatia, Tsipora Berman, and Bob Penner. I'd Importantly, I'd like to thank our very generous sponsors for today's event, STRATCOM, QPBC, and the SFU Institute for the Humanities. We're very grateful for their support. In the final days of the Alberta election, it seemed as though the entire country was following this campaign. Could Alberta possibly end a 44-year dynasty of progressive conservative power? How much, about, how much of this election was about Rachel Notley's admirable campaign? Was it about being split on the right? What was actually happening on the ground? And importantly, what are the impl implications of this election in Alberta, in BC, and all across the country? We've invited four top strategists and campaigners to join us today to discuss these very questions and more. We expect a dynamic, respectful, feisty, and thoughtful discussion. I would encourage you all to tweet today about today's event under the hashtag ABDebrief. So let me start with the introductions. It's really a pleasure to be joined by our moderator, Max Cameron. Max teaches at the University of British Columbia in the Department of Political Science, where he directs the Center for Study of Democratic Institutions. His research and teaching focuses on problems of democracy and constitutionalism with a focus on the separation of powers. At the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, Cameron is working on constitutional reform and citizen engagement. He helped organize the first ever Summer Institute for Future Legislatures. Max will be directing the conversation today among the four panelists who have generously offered their time to share their thinking and expertise with us. So let me introduce our panel. To begin with, appropriately on the far left, Jerry Scott. <laughs> As most of you know, Jerry has been campaigning for over 40 years beginning as a volunteer in the 1972 election that brought Dave Barrett to the office as the first NDP Premier of BC. Scott served twice as BC NDP Provincial Secretary, most recently between 2003 and 2006, and held several roles in the NDP governments of Dave Barrett, Mike Harcourt, and Glenn Clark. Scott also served for five years as the climate change director for the David Suzuki Foundation and has contributed to democracy building work all over the world with the National Democratic Institute. Most recently, Scott served as the campaign manager in the NDP's successful campaign in Alberta. Jerry, welcome back from Italy. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you. <laughs> Moving further to the right, 
I'd like to introduce Mike McDonald. Wait till she gets to me. Right? Right? Mike left McDonald left. is a communications and public affairs consultant based in Vancouver. He led Premier Christy Clark's winning leadership campaign team in 2011, led her transition team, and served as chief of staff to the Premier. He left the Premier's office in May 2012 to take on the leadership of the BC Liberal Party's re-election campaign that executed a victory in the 2013 election. Mike was selected as one of Vancouver's Power 50 in both 2011 and 2013. He is a lifelong British Columbian and a graduate of UBC, and he has written extensively on the Alberta election. Mike, thank you very much for joining us here today. I'd now like to give a very warm welcome to Carrie Toll. Carrie Toll is a lifelong Albertan and a former member of the Legislative Assembly of Alberta for the Insenfell Sylvan Lake area. Did I get that right? Innisfell. Innisfell. <laughs> in 2008, Carrie's brother was diagnosed with Huntington's disease. Carrie became involved in politics after her brother was not able to access proper care in a facility of his choice with dignity and respect. After her brother's death in 2010 and her father's subsequent stroke in January 2011, Carrie decided to make a difference by getting involved in politics. Carrie was elected as a Wild Rose MLA in 2012. Called fierce, ferocious, and caring by many in the media, Carrie went on to become a champion for seniors, vulnerable, and conservative values. Carrie became frustrated with the leadership of Danielle Smith and the functionality of the Wild Rose in 2014, and on November 20, 24, 2014, she crossed the floor to sit with the Progressive Conservative Caucus. Today, <laughs> Carrie is back in Insenfell on her acreage, enjoying some time with her family and pursuing her public relations and advocacy career. I want to thank you, Carrie, for joining us today and being willing to share your on-the-ground experience. It's a real pleasure to welcome Anne McGrath all the way from Ottawa to join us today. Consistently identified as one of the 100 most influential people in government and politics in Ottawa, Anne McGrath brings extensive experience and knowledge of federal politics, the trade union movement, the NGO sector, social justice organizations, and the NDP at every level. Anne served as Chief of Staff to official opposition New Democratic Party leaders Jack Layton, Nicole Termel, and Thomas Mulcair, where she provided political advice to both the leader and the caucus. Anne also served as President of the New Democratic Party of Canada from 2006 to 2009. Currently, Anne holds the position of the NDP's National Director and 2015 Campaign Director, Anne, thank you for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule these days to be with us here in Vancouver. Thank you. We're going to, I'm going to hand it over to Max Cameron. We're going to hear from uh, the panelists each, have a moderated discussion, and then open it up to questions from all of you. There will be a range of perspectives today and I trust that this will be a respectful and lively discussion. A reminder to tweet under the hashtag ABDebrief. And with all of that, please join me in welcoming Max Cameron to begin our discussion. Well, thank you very much, Mira. I, this is just a, a wonderful event, and, and it couldn't be more timely. But more than that, I'm just you know, struck, and I think I uh, have to congratulate the organizers of this event for assembling the most remarkable group of people. I mean, we have here four experienced practitioners. Uh, I'm a political scientist, so I watch politics from the sideline. But we have an opportunity here today to hear from four people who are involved in the political fray, um, who uh, have unique perspectives to offer for understanding this remarkable uh, 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 event in, in, in Alberta. Um, and I think that, you know, for me at least, I don't know about the rest of you, uh, the result of that election uh, came as, as quite a shock. 
Uh, I'm not a practitioner, so I'm not involved in learning the practice of politics, uh, but I do from time to time uh, offer commentary on, on political events and occasionally uh, make predictions. Normally they're wrong and you could say, well, that's pretty dumb <laughs> to be in the business of making predictions without a good crystal ball or at least uh, some sort of microeconomic uh, uh, model. Uh, but but uh, I actually think that the point about making predictions is not whether you're right or wrong. Uh, it, it's one way of kind of testing whether the reasons behind your expectations are true. And so when I heard about the outcome of the election in Alberta, uh, it was a real surprise to me because I just never thought, frankly, that Albertans would vote for the NDP. Uh, and uh, it turns out that, uh, as one uh, blogger put it, uh, when they go to the polls, they actually stampede rather than vote. So really voted substantially uh, for the NDP. So this, I think, is a, is a great opportunity to listen to some people who can give us some real insight into what happened in Alberta. So I'd encourage you to think about what did you predict? What did you, what, what did you expect? And what would you expect to hear from some of our practitioners? So keep that in mind as we go through the presentations. Uh, and then we'll have a bit of a moderated discussion after the presentations. And then we'll open it up. We'll make sure that there's enough time for, for Q&A. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, turn the the mic over um, to, to uh, Jerry Scott to give us a sense of you know, how did this happen? What were some of the key events? What were your expectations going into this race? And, and what explains this uh, quite remarkable outcome? Uh, that's a tall order. And if we had 55 minutes each, we could more fully answer that. But in five minutes, <laughs> tough, uh, tough to do, but I'll try. Um, so I'll take a couple minutes to talk about what I think w was, was very critical, and that was the situation before the election. And you know, we all know that this is a four-year thing or a three-year thing, depending. And uh, the 28 days in this Alberta campaign, I think, was very, very important. But I would say that the stampede was well underway prior to the 28 days. And, uh, and critical to that, I think, are three or four factors concerning the PCs, three or four factors concerning the NDP, and then also you know, the positioning of Wild Rose and the Liberal Party. Um, with the PCs in this period before the election started, I would say they, they had a number of issues, problems, challenges, and not a hell of a lot of opportunities. And so they were. Uh, with, with dropping oil prices, they were dealt a relatively tough hand and then made it a lot worse. Um, first of all, they spent literally months telling the people of Alberta that there were no answers, that suicide was an option, not necessarily the best one, <laughs> but this was a doom and gloom message day after day, week after week, month after month. Uh, oil prices down, life as we know it is over, and there isn't a hell of a lot that I, as Premier, intend to do about that other than raise your taxes and cut your health and education. And so this wasn't a good way to campaign, in my view. <laughs> uh, there, there, so this was a factor that, that went on and on and on. And, and the budget that was tabled prior to the election reflected what I would call the doom and gloom message. Uh, secondly, there was, uh, and again, with, and it really wasn't the fault of the Premier, but he inherited a, a very negative legacy from the Redford years, the Stelmack years, the Klein years. I mean, ever since Peter Lougheed left politics, there's been a number of of problems in Alberta that, that none of these premiers really fixed. There was a lot of Band-Aids, and uh, this, this legacy really caught up with them. And I think Mr. Prentice tried in a number of ways to deal with this, uh, but, but it didn't happen. And nobody in the Conservative caucus or cabinet or the premier could explain to Albertans where the money went. I mean, we're talking about a, a couple or three years of record high oil prices, and yet the ceiling fell in on surgical wards in hospitals. People in Calgary are, have lotteries to determine where their kid goes to school. So the backlog 
in health and education and in other areas was tremendous despite high oil prices. Uh, this is a factor that brought a lot of frustration. Um, the deal with Wild Rose, and I know Kerry will speak about this, uh, brought a real backlash, and I, and I won't take more time on that, but it did not work out as planned. Uh, and finally, I would say a major factor was that the, the Premier and the ministers, the profile PC personalities, just weren't connecting with the public. Uh, there was a distance, a sense of arrogance, in some cases, uh, uh, I I illustrations of corruption, and so again, the 44 years of power kind of caught up with people in, in a more personal and visceral way. On the NDP side, um, I would say, number one, that the party, and this is before I arrived there, certainly, uh, and I started working in the Assembly in January, but for some time prior to that, the party had determined that this coming election, which was to be 2016, was going to be different, that they were tired of having two seats or four seats or no seats, and you know, a significant amount of planning and effort had been made to make this campaign a breakthrough campaign, and you know, it was very successful planning, I think, and, uh, and the change in leadership uh, happened in October, and Rachel was seen as change, and, and no disrespect to Brian Mason, who did an incredible job as leader for a number of years, uh, but I think the change to, to Rachel signaled to people something new at the Alberta NDP, and you know, before long, she really caught fire as, as a leader who could connect in a very personal way with, with millions of people, and, and that grew and grew and grew, so before long, there was this sort of Rachel uh, factor that was very big, very big, and then in the campaign itself became a tsunami, really. Um, I would say also, related to that, that because of the Wild Rose arrangements with the Conservatives, that there was a vacuum created about who, who will be the real opposition. And the NDP filled that very successfully long before the 28-day election period. So that the Wild Rose deal didn't just backfire in and of itself, but created a huge space for the NDP. And, and Rachel filled that space and was seen as the alternative long before the election started. And, and then that dynamic was reinforced, I think, in a number of ways by the, the uh, pattern of politicking that I described with the PCs. The debate uh, crystallized many of these trends. Uh, the budget crystallized those trends. And I would also say, and I have to wrap up, this is why we need 55 minutes each, um, uh, that the, the NDP policies and platform were really popular. This was conventional social democratic stuff. You know, banks will pay more, and you'll get better schools. And this worked. And the fact is, the people of Alberta turned their back on the austerity message of the PCs, and quite willingly and knowingly embraced social democratic policies that were simple, straightforward, and spoke to the needs of ordinary people. So I'll leave it there, and there's much more to be said and later, you know, at 4 or 5 o'clock this afternoon, we can complete this. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you So, Mike, a lot of us thought the NDP was going to win here provincially, and, and they didn't, and, and you saw that from the inside. Uh, did you expect the NDP victory in Alberta? By the time the uh, campaign was in its final stages, yes. Um, but it was hard to convince people uh, of that, and I think that was an a, a interesting factor of the campaign where expectations were misaligned with what reality was. But let me just start by congratulating Jerry and Ann and everyone who was involved with the election. It was a historic win for the NDP, and um, no matter what happens going forward, that was a, a pretty special night, I'm sure, for all of you, so congratulations. Um, 
This room here today uh, has a different feel than the last time I was here. It's where Christy Clark uh, kicked off her leadership campaign in December 2010. So it has a different feel, Doug. A little bit, a little bit of a different vibe. I know it's a couple people who were here. Um, Alberta, you know, since 1910, Canada has changed its governments 12 times, BC nine times. Uh, up until last month, Alberta changed their government three times. So that tells you a lot about, I guess, the psychology uh, of the election and the resistance to the fact that the government could change. And uh, so you have to, you know, while the campaign was on, I was wondering, well, why would they change now after this pattern of not changing? Well, I think the first thing was uh, the PCs themselves. Uh, sometimes parties go on a march of folly, and no matter what they do, they just seem to put the wrong foot forward. And I think there was the look in the mirror comment, the budget, uh, in hindsight, the floor crossings. These were all types of uh, issues that piled up on the PCs and uh, contributed to that, that change. That was my view from afar. Uh, the second big factor I saw was Wild Rose and how it was uh, shattered organizationally and probably emotionally by, the, by what happened with the disintegration of the party in the, I guess it was the last fall of uh, 2014. Yet the resuscitation of Wild Rose may have been surprising as well in terms of regrouping, getting a new leader who had some experience and uh, who had a bit of a compelling personal story. So I think Wild Rose was a volatile factor. But uh, tough for them to get off the mat and it appeared that they were more about survival than winning. Uh, the third thing was the NDP and I, yeah, I agree with Jerry. I think uh, they had the right leader. Uh, they were ready, probably the most election ready of the parties on what was a snap election. And uh, we're in a position to take advantage of the luck that was going to come their way. But when I was looking at it from afar and I was checking my uh, inside sources in Alberta, one was my 89-year-old uncle who belongs to every political party so he can vote at nomination meetings. <laughs> and uh, he told me early on change was in the air. So I said, okay, I better pay attention to this. So I looked at the numbers, looked at the available polling, and uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, polling's a bit of a dark art, uh, Bob. but. Uh, it was pretty inescapable that uh, Edmonton was a fortress for the NDP and they had a very strong base to build from to head out to the rest of the province. But it wasn't apparent to me in the early part of the election that the NDP was going to be able to, to extend beyond that base in a, in a way that it could govern. What struck me actually was uh, Wild Rose, uh, when you look at a seat model and apply the popular vote to the seats, Wild Rose could have actually, in a perfect world, won the election losing the popular vote by seven or eight points because they, they owned, uh, their base was more rural, uh, the seats are smaller, and uh, if the cookie crumbled the right way, um, it might be Premier Brian Jean today. So the NDP, uh, from my outset, from my standpoint, I think uh, Jerry executed on this quite well, was had to power through and, and, and win by a considerable margin in order to assure itself of majority government. And that's, when you, look at the, when you look in the media and you look at the polls, you have to factor in a few things. You have to factor in turnout. And the NDP base is usually much stronger in the 18 to 34s than the other parties. And like it or not, 18 to 34s only voted about 75% of the rate of the average turnout. On the other side, the 55 pluses voted about 125% of the average turnout. So, you know, the NDP had to power through that too. So to get to a win, in this election was even more impressive in my mind. And the NDP quadrupled their popular vote. And I don't think there's been a, a party in Canada that's gone into government quadrupling their vote from the previous election, unless you go back to the last Alberta election uh, when Peter Lowe had won. So was it, a, uh, was it an orange wave? Uh, I think it's a mixed story. I think a lot of things lined up for the NDP in a way that uh, they couldn't have organized themselves in terms of the PC self-destructing and the situation with Wild Rose. But clearly, uh, the campaign team for the NDP put themselves in a, in a very strong position to win. Whether it extends beyond the Rockies um, is hard to say. You know, I think the timing between now and the federal election bodes very well for the federal NDP because there's a honeymoon effect that's going to be in place in Alberta, and I don't think the 
the, the rough stuff's going to happen quite yet, not by October. If you look at Bob Ray, he was elected in September, and he was doing pretty well four or five months later before things kind of uh, got rough. So every government's going to be given a, a bit of leeway early on, and uh, that should bode well for the NDP brand heading into the federal election. Uh, I'll just quickly end on um, what I saw as similarities to the BC campaign. The first thing is the psychology of being the overdog and the underdog. It's a real burden for a party if you are expected to win and everyone thinks you're going to win and your own supporters think you're going to win and your candidates think you're going to win. No, no matter what they say, yeah, 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 we get it, yeah, we, we get it, we're, yeah, no, we have to campaign hard, all that stuff. If everybody's reinforcing that you're the leader, it's tough on actually the leader. And I would say in the BC NDP last election, that, that would have been a burden. And it was a great advantage as the underdog to have expectations so low. And uh, I think in Alberta this time, I think Jim Prentice could have uh, shouted from the rooftops that his government was in trouble. I'm not sure anyone would have believed it. Uh, the, the, other, the other similarity I'll close on here is his leadership. I think you had two female leaders who were uh, very relatable to the mainstream public who uh, were con uh, juxtaposed with male leaders who uh, had difficulty connecting on an emotional level with voters. And I think uh, they both came from different places where Rachel Notley was uh, really an insurgent taking over the PC, you know, hegemonic power. Christy Clark very much almost an insurgent within her own party. But they both brought a certain uh, personal quality to the, to the campaigns. They both nailed their debates and that character that they had kind of uh, was embraced by their own political party's campaign strategy. And I think that's one of the reasons why in both cases there was a win. So I'll leave it at that and turn it back to you, Max. Thank you very much, Mike. <laughs> So, Carrie, we've already heard about the floor crossing. You lived through that. What can we learn from your experiences, really, in those six months from December to May? Well, uh, if any of you are expecting uh, to get elected in floor cross, I highly recommend you probably not do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people always say to me, why did you get involved with the Wild Rose? And, and for me, I'd never been a member of any political party. I, I didn't come from that family background. We were conservatives because my parents voted conservative because their parents voted conservative because their parents voted conservative. No one really knew why we did those things. It's just how things were done in Alberta. And uh, <laughs> when I got involved with the Wild Rose, uh, quite frankly, um, I paid $63,000 for my brother's care. Long-term care is not covered under universal health care. Uh, my, my dad had had a stroke. My brother died of Huntington's. We had to fight to get his care. I had to advocate for him. I had to appeal the decision for his care 13 times. I had to go to the media. Um, all to get a, a, a simple long-term care bed so he could die in two years. And then, you know, fight the system and where they wanted to place him and all those fun things. And I thought to myself, if it's that difficult for somebody like me who worked in the healthcare system at the time, what must it be like for those who don't have advocates? Then with my father's stroke, we're in rural Alberta, no access to home care, uh, no access to, to basic, simple things that should happen. And again, having to pay privately for a home care nurse to come in and take care of my dad. And so I decided that in order to get involved, you have to go and get involved. And for me, when I was looking at two parties, what you saw is the dynamics of Ed Stelmeck just stepping down, a nine-month leadership race, which had, no offense to anyone in here, five old white guys, and one woman who I had no idea who she was. And you had Danielle Smith, the leader of the Wild Rose. And quite frankly, Danielle was 38 years at, old at the time, um, really uh, resonated with her. She was, you know, power to the people kind of person and a strong conservative with strong conservative values. Um, I got elected in 2012, took out a cabinet minister from the PC party and uh, became a strong, strong voice within the party, became a strong voice for the vulnerable and for seniors under a Wild Rose banner and uh, became very committed to the party and very committed to the leader, Danielle Smith. Um, as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, standing up for the vulnerable and, and wanting to keep places like Michener Center open and, and talking about better care and better service uh, for our frontline workers and for our seniors um, didn't sort of go along the lines of the Wild Rose. <laughs> I'm not saying they're against that. It just it tended to uh, fall um, a little differently on the side, yet I was becoming probably the next biggest uh, voice of the Wild Rose outside of Danielle Smith. 
When you pair that with a brand new party that was protesting the PCs, 17 individuals who could have won in 2012 had it not been for comments on climate change and comments on um, some unfortunate comments from Mr. Huntsberger on, um, on, on gays, um, we lost. And we should have been government in 2012. Um, then as we went in, the leadership under Danielle just really never took hold. Uh, you know, we were a party with no chief of staff for two and a half years, official opposition. Um, smaller and smaller advisories to the leader and quite frankly, once, um, once Mr. Prentice came on scene, um, the leader quite frankly lost um, the fire in her belly and um, went into a tailspin. And it's, you, you know what it's like when you know you're starting to go down, um, the vultures come out and uh, membership didn't want our party to go to the centre, which is what you need to govern. Um, and the caucus, um, every, everyone believes they can be the leader. Everyone believes they're doing a better job than the person doing the job. And so it became this dynamic of a lot of infighting, a lot of uh, where do we go from here, a push-pull of the membership. Um, I know even for me, you know, I, I introduced a bill called the Seniors Advocate Act, and the membership told me if I took it forward, they would um, kick me out. But more importantly, they voted it down at the AGM. So that made it very difficult for me to do what I thought was best for Royal Burtons. So what did that mean in the 2015 election? Well, when I crossed the floor in November, um, again, don't recommend you do it, uh, <laughs> um, I was sick to my stomach. I did not want to leave the Wild Rose. I did not want to leave Danielle Smith, but I felt I had to. And as a conservative, where do you go? Where, your next home, what is your next home? And in the Wild Rose, we believe Jim Prentice was the next Premier of Alberta. We believed he was the one who could bring the Conservatives under the right banner. And um, everybody in the Wild Rose was threatened and very concerned about the demise of the Wild Rose should Mr. Prentice uh, come on board and do what he said he was going to do. I obviously, um, when I crossed, it was me and Ian Donovan, and neither of us knew each other was crossing. Two different dynamics in our own party. And had it been just me, I probably could have survived the election. However, on December 17, when nine crossed, including the leader of the official opposition en masse, um, the anger and the outrage was palatable at every option. And what I would say to you is it, 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 the PCs and the Wild Rose had become the Enron of politics. <laughs> it, had, uh, it, had, uh, it was seen as a corporate takeover. It was seen as Jim Prentice as the CEO. It, it was seen as backroom deal where uh, no, none of your um, stakeholders were consulted and your shareholders were sort of given the shaft. So it created a real problem. And I had hoped to have another year to uh, rebuild in my riding. But I also had to rebuild relationships with PCs because I crossed. I'd spent the last three years bashing the very party I'd crossed to. So you can imagine my difficulty <laughs> to try and go forward and win a nomination. I was successful in winning my nomination, um, very successful in winning my nomination, but the narrative had already changed. The narrative from December 17th to my nomination was very, very negative. Um, we, we in the PC party thought that uh, the narrative was really that the nominations were the election. Uh, they never were. And once the majority of well, three Wild Rosers decided not to run again, probably smart, um, the other three lost, Daniel Smith, uh, Gary Bickman, and Rod Fox, and three of us won. And um, heading into the election at the doors uh, in 2015, we knew ahead of time we were in deep trouble. And I knew in rural central Alberta that the question was not, was the NDP going to win? The question was, is it a minority PC government or a minority NDP government? The reality of it was, is at the doors, the the, it was never a Wild Rose government. It was Wild Rose official opposition, minority PC, minority NDP government, and who wins what and who are the power players in either role. Um, so very, very difficult at the doors. Um, we'll get more into the election as a whole. I would just say that I, I, I would disagree slightly with my, my friends here beside me in that I don't think it was the policies of the NDP that uh, Albertans voted in favour of. I think it was an absolute betrayal of voters. Um, I think it was anger that the PCs had to go. 43 years was long enough. And there was just enough in the NDP platform that said, we'll give it a shot. And so that's what they did. And um, I'm, quite frankly, I'm excited to see where we go here. It's going to be very difficult times for any Conservative Party to um, bash uh, the NDP right now because a lot of the issues we were famous for over the last three years um, had to do with health care and social issues. So thank you very much.
Thanks, Dave. Well, Anne, we're very curious to know what your take is on what this means for federal politics. We've got an election coming up in the fall. Yes. How is this going to impact on that? Well, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, I want to say thanks uh, so much, everybody, for being here, because it's great to see this much interest in the Alberta election here in, in Vancouver. This is fantastic to see this kind of turnout and this much interest in the Alberta election. Um, there is no question that what happened in Alberta has put a spring in the step of New Democrats across the country. It has really kind of, uh, it speaks to the hopes and dreams uh, of New Democrats and uh, really, lifted our, really lifted our spirits. One of the key things that I think that the Alberta election has done is it has contributed to breaking that whole uh, red door, blue door dynamic that is so prevalent in Canadian politics, right? This idea that you only have two choices. You either vote conservative or you vote liberal. And there's this, uh, in French, uh, is often referred to as the alternance. It's like you just go from one to the other. Um, so it has really contributed to breaking that, uh, breaking that down. Now, um, I think that the beginning of breaking that down was probably the last federal election uh, and what happened in Quebec. Um, it is hard for some of us to believe that the strongholds for New Democrats in this country are Quebec and Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> but certainly, uh, certainly what happened in, in Quebec in the last federal election did have a lot to do with breaking that down. Now the dynamic after that, of course, was to say it was a fluke, it was luck, it's all going to disappear, it's going to be a mess. And I think that that's harder, to, it's harder to make that case. Uh, some people are going to try and make that case in Alberta, I'm sure. Uh, and people tried to make that case in Quebec. But of course, that's not what's happened, right? So if you look at what's happened uh, uh, in Quebec, and I think it's the same, uh, we'll see the same thing in Alberta, is that uh, those members of parliament who were expected to kind of crash and burn have actually turned out to be principled, progressive, disciplined, hardworking, excellent parliamentarians in Parliament and in their communities. And so, and, and I think we're going to, and if you look at the cabinet that, uh, that Premier Notley has assembled, you see that this is a, a very worthy cabinet. And it is a cabinet that uh, not only the, the size of the cabinet, but the way that the cabinet is structured, who's in the cabinet. I think that, uh, and, and of course, we have the swearing in of the, of the MLAs today. So I think that. That, uh, that experience uh, from, the, from what happened in the official, when we formed official opposition federally and then what's happening now in Alberta I think is going to really contribute to uh, opening the door to the idea that you can vote for the change that you want and actually get it. And that's I think the key message for progressives is that we don't have to hold our nose and vote for something else. We can vote for what we believe in and that's, that's I think the number one thing that that gives us. So one of the things that Rachel Notley talked about during the campaign that I found very, very important because I lived for uh, uh, 21 years in Alberta and I ran there and, and, uh, and, and I you know, have always found that uh, as, as, a, an, as somebody who was, uh, kind of grew up politically in Alberta, uh, this feeling that people had always that you know, Alberta was so right wing, it was so conservative, there was always this sense of like how could you have lived there, you know, people would say that. And it never resonated with my experience uh, in Alberta because I don't ever, I have never believed that Albertans are inherently right wing or, 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 uh, or conservative. And one of the things that I thought Rachel Notley made the case for very, very well was this idea of connecting your values with your votes. Um, and that's, I think, a large part of what did happen there. I, I do agree with Jerry that, that I think that the progressive platform that, uh, that, that Rachel Notley and, and the team put forward had a lot to do with uh, uh, where people went they, when they decided that they didn't want, what, they decided they don't want this anymore, you have to decide where you're going to go, what's the alternative? And I think that that had a lot to do with it. And of course there are other explanations around things like the demographics changing in Alberta, but I also do believe that there was, that it has always been a fairly progressive, forward-looking province with a, a strong entrepreneurial spirit, and I think uh, the, the desire for change was very strong, and uh, that platform I think had a lot to do with, uh, with people making that, uh, making that, that, that leap. So they had a very progressive offer and they had an experienced and principled leader and they had a strong team. And I think uh, I would make the case that that's what we have federally as well. We have a, a desire for change, we have a progressive offer, we have an experienced and principled leader with a plan and the team that can actually do it. So that's what I think uh, is the lesson for us federally. And when we look at the kinds of things that 
uh, Tom Mulcair and the federal NDP are putting forward, they are things that resonate, I think, with the majority of Canadians. Um, uh, the Broadband Institute has done some very good research on the progressive values of Canadians, and I think that's what we're offering. So we're talking about things like childcare, which I think speaks to Canadians across the country. <laughs> So, and one of the messages in our childcare plan, which is for $15, you know, a million spaces, $15 a day, that's a national childcare plan. One of the key messages in that is that it is one, a national childcare program is one election away. And that, I think, does speak to people because it's about, again, voting for the change that you want and actually getting it. It's about things like health care. The $15 an hour uh, minimum wage, I think, also speaks to those kinds of progressive values. An inquiry on the murdered and missing uh, Indigenous women. The, the restoration of, of, the, of the, the funding for CBC and Radio Canada. Uh, changes to small business taxes. Uh, support for manufacturing and innovation. All of these kinds of things. I think that the sort of the specificity of those, uh, of that offer, the fact that it's progressive, that it actually will create some change, all of that is important. And if you look at Alberta again, you will see that not only was that a good platform that spoke to everybody, but it will be implemented. She will, uh, she, she will implement that change. So people voted for change, they're going to get change, and it won't be crazy scary change. It will be stable, it will be practical, it will be pragmatic, it will be in the best tradition of progressive, pragmatic, prairie, populist, social democratic governments. And that's what we're going to get in Alberta. So I think that that's also very, very important. So when I look at the federal scene, I see that we have all those foundations there as well. We have a, a good campaign shaping up. We have a, a strong, competent, and principled opposition. You have to just look at, for instance, uh, the, 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 C50, the way that we've dealt with C51, and you can see that this is a principled, this is a principled opposition. So we have the leader that is effectively uh, opposing, uh, opposing this government, that is ready to be the Prime Minister. We have a path to victory. We have a tired and scandal-plagued government that voters want to replace. We have ground strength across the country, a program that resonates, and a leader and caucus that has outperformed expectations and a team of candidates that are ready to win. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I believe it's fair to say that the campaign has begun. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so we've got time. I'm going to ask a few questions just to get things going, and then we'll open it up to you. Uh, there's so much that we can talk about. We can talk about um, energy, politics, pipelines, implications for other parts of the, of the country, and so forth. But I want to start with, I um, uh, actually want to use a quote. Um, Preston Manning says that his father uh, said after winning elections, which was, now that the great electoral tide uh, has washed ashore. Let us see what uh, it has brought us and whether we have enough timber to build a cabinet. Uh, so that, that was the quote. And when I saw then that there were 12 members of the cabinet, I wondered, did the great electoral tide not wash ashore enough timber for a larger cabinet? Why, why was that uh, decision? Well, that should be directed to Anne, who was involved directly in transition. But I would briefly say that I, I think one of the factors, and Anne can correct me on this, because I wasn't involved in transition, was that Rachel said we want greater efficiency in government. And I, I think we saw Alberta cabinets get bigger and bigger and bigger. We see the same thing with this so-called uh, efficient uh, uh, leader in, in Ottawa, Harper where you know, there's more and more layers. None of them have any power, but they have paychecks, right? And so th this, is, this is a waste of money. And I think Rachel Notley said, we're going to have efficiency. We're going to have accountability. And that doesn't mean you need a crowd of people in cabinet, but Anne may want to comment further. Want to add to that? Yeah, I think that there's that for sure. Um, so you know, the, the conservative government had become very bloated, and uh, I, I think that there was a sense that everybody had a title. You know, that, that everybody had something. Uh, so I think that in a in a new in a new caucus, everybody obviously has something to do. They all have a lot of work to do. But a smaller cabinet, I think, speaks to uh, the pragmatism of uh, of Rachel Notley's uh, government. But also, you'll note that she didn't uh, it didn't. Require Require great restructuring, so there wasn't any merging or reorganization or any of those th kinds of things that will create any significant upheaval. So it, it again, it's very stable, but it also sends that message of actually having government that makes sense. 
Thanks. Mike, I wanted to ask you a question about the youth vote, because we knew from the polls that the NDP was doing well among youth, but we also know that youth turnout tends to be lower than turnout among older demographics. Um, were you surprised then by the youth vote? Is there something to be learned here about youth participation? Well, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not sure what Jerry's numbers would say. I'm not sure what the turnout was among the youth in Alberta. Uh, I did notice that in terms of the public polls that were out there, the NDP vote actually did come in a little lower on election day, and the PC vote came in a little bit higher than the polls were predicting. I don't know whether that indicates anything at all, but. Uh, you know, I, I think it's just, um, it's a societal thing. I, I, I think as people get older, they get more engaged in uh, civic affairs. They get more invested in mortgages and things and more motivated to vote. I, I'm not sure it's, I think we'd all like everyone to vote uh, voluntarily. But uh, I, I think it's just something that uh, is a characteristic of our, of our system. What was your sense, Karen? Um, well, I, it, certainly, I, I mean, when you take a look at the um, amount of voters that came out, it was 58%, which was a 4% increase even from 2012, which is fairly, fairly huge for Alberta. Um, in my own riding, uh, you know, in the last election, we had 13, 14,000 people come out, and it went up to 18,000. I wouldn't necessarily say that it's a youth vote. I would probably say it was that middle ground vote, the 30 to 45 sector that actually came out instead of saying, I can, you know, bright, shiny thing over here, so I'm not going to go vote. So instead, actually said, I'm going to go vote, and I'm going to make all my friends vote. Um, I just want to pivot really quickly back to what Anne was saying, was... You know, under Premier Stelmeck and Premier Redford, absolutely the cabinet became bloated. Under Premier Redford, half of caucus was in cabinet. But under Premier Prentice, um, it got reduced to 20. One of the things that I would suggest to you is, is there's small cabinets and then there's sometimes too small of cabinets. Health and seniors together, um, and I offer this as some weird sense of advice, seniors get lost in a health ministry that is so massively huge that the issue of seniors gets lost in there. Same with human services and two other ministries put together under one minister. Human services itself is, is massive. But I do think Miss Notley was um, incredibly smart by picking 12 because what she essentially said is, I'm going to pick these 12 for now. And I'm not going to throw the rest of my MLAs out to the wolves. And I create a mentorship program and allow people to slowly build up. And when I need to increase to 15 or 18 or likely 20, um, which is not a big cabinet. You, you want to reduce the cost of government, you reduce the bureaucracy, the political bureaucracy, not cabinet ministers as per se. When she goes and builds that, she takes four or five months to build to the next level. And then those people are ready for question period in October. It, from my perspective, it was less about um, small cabinet, more about pragmatic thinking about the fact that she has to face a, an experienced opposition and in reality not wanting any one of her inexperienced MLAs to go out there and really create a bad message day. I'd like to pick up also on a point that you made uh, that you don't think it's about policies. It was really more a rejection of the, uh, of the conservatives and, and the wild rose. And I'll, I'll, I'll put that to, to Jerry in just a minute. But before moving on, could I ask you to just to say in, in a few words, you know, this, the decision to cross the floor was a difficult one. You said that you did not want to do it. Why did you do it then? Um, well, um, I'll put it to you this way. When you're, when you're in the party and, and the very people who are mentoring you, some senior MLAs, are saying we're done, um, it's time for us to go. We are, whether it happened today or it happens in March, it's a matter of a period of time. And you can see things rolling into the toilet. <laughs> That's how I'm going to put it. There was a massive storm brewing. We had five MLAs already discussing openly leaving the party. We had um, membership gathering and constituency associations to take out the leader. There were ballots at the AGM to remove Danielle Smith as leader. We had a membership who wanted to keep the party pretty far right, but that's not realistic for government. And as my husband said to me the day before I crossed, he said, this is a decision about you. Um, I can assure you I did not cross for power. I'm unelected today. I received nothing. I asked for nothing. I made the decision to leave because I could no longer sit beside a leadership that was no longer leading. I could no longer sit in a party that was telling Albertans one thing but doing another. Um, I could no longer be the voice of the party when I didn't believe the party was going to do what it said. And did I make a bad decision going to the PCs? Look, on November 24th, I made the right decision for me at the right time in my life, and I stand by that decision. I don't regret it a day in my life, and I will never regret it. That was the decision I made. I own it, and I honor that decision. And at the end of the day, we all have to uh, live with it. I don't think that's why I lost. I think there was an NDP wave. I think there was a PC party that was also going down. But I, I would say to everyone here is that um, 
let's you know, just because the Wild Rose got 22 seats, remember they lost 136,000 votes. They didn't break into urban Alberta. They didn't break into rural Alberta, and essentially took home 136,000 votes less. So when Alberta was at its maddest, when they were at their angriest, when they were wanting change, conservatives went left. They didn't go right. And I think that speaks volumes for Alberta. That is so interesting. Thank you very much. And, and so Jerry. Um, you know, uh, removing corporate and union donations from politics, um, uh, raising the minimum wage, phasing out coal, uh, making taxes more progressive, increasing royalties on, on oil. Are these policies that play well with the electorate? Is it the, is, are those the policies that won, or was it a, an implosion of a dynasty and the NDP happened to be best well, able it, to? It was both. That's I, 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 you know, I didn't have a great deal of time to expand on all these things, but clearly the conservatives misread the mood. I mean, people wanted change. There were problems long before the price of oil dropped. There were significant problems that started with Ralph Klein that have never been fixed, never addressed in a mature manner. And they built up and built up over the years, I would argue, and I'm not from Alberta, but I, I think it was very evident that some of the Klein stuff was never fixed. I mean, this guy, you know, and I, I realize he's passed away, and I don't want to sound disrespectful, but some of his politics were nuts. And, and, <laughs> and the, results, the results are still there today, where you got to go in a raffle in Calgary to figure out which school your kid can go to, which may involve an hour-long bus ride. And that, that is the legacy of Klein, and, and you know, Kerry may correct me, and, and I stand to be corrected. And, and so, it was a combination of this PC, a series of PC problems. And, and some of them were deepened by the decisions of the Premier. The, the remark of look in the mirror uh, was very significant. That crystallized this attitude of PC distance from the voters, of arrogance perhaps, and certainly insensitivity. And, and so if you have a cabinet and a Premier spending months uh, selling this message of doom and gloom with no real answers that don't involve ordinary people paying more in order to get less, that sets the table for a leader such as Rachel Notley who is prepared to say we can do better, there are answers that, that you know, having somebody who makes 40 grand a year pay higher taxes to get less health care, to get less education for their kids, to get less long-term care for their parents, whereas a bank or an oil company will pay no increase in taxes whatsoever. So these policies resonated with people. I mean, $15 minimum wage and improvements in health and education resonated with folks. Uh, people recognized that the royalty structure wasn't delivering when oil prices were high. And it's important to note that we didn't campaign on raising royalties. We campaigned on a significant, professional, independent review of the royalty structure. And that's a very important difference because, you know, whether it's, it's Brian Mason or Rachel Notley or anybody else, in Alberta, everybody knows that you can't tax out of, an exi out of existence the most significant industry. And, and so there was sensitivity to the issue, but at the same time, Albertans wanted to say, where is the money? When oil's at 100 bucks a barrel, we still don't get schools and hospitals. So let's take a second look at this. And that was, that was very, very popular as was the issue of adding value to the resource rather than simply uh, uh, push everything into export pipelines for jobs in Texas, essentially, or China. Um, we want those jobs in Alberta. So speaking of pipelines, uh, Mike, what does this mean for Christy Clark and the BC Liberals? Well, I think uh, it's going to be an interesting year coming up in terms of how the Alberta NDP government um, approaches uh, the oil issue. Um, premier Notley, like any premier, really has to province first, party second. 
and she has to determine what's in her best, the best interest of the province, best economic interest. And clearly, oil is in the best interest of Alberta. It's what keeps the hospitals open, the schools. And uh, as she's acknowledged, market access for oil is a, is a real priority for the industry. That's at odds with some agendas here in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's different options on, on market access, but I, I think it's going to be fascinating to see uh, as Anne says, the pragmatic prairie approach on some of these issues and how it, how it squares with uh, how British Columbians see that. And I, I think it's actually potentially a real gift to the oil industry to have someone like Premier Notley out in front on these issues because uh, that creates a new dynamic with the environmentalists and uh, perhaps some of the neighbors. But we don't know yet how that's how that's going to play out, but it's, it's, it's a new dynamic that obviously no one really expected. Right. And um, you want to pick up on that, but also I wanted to, uh, you were uh, very optimistic about what this means federally, but one reading of the election is that the right was divided and that allowed the left to win. Federally, uh, the right is united and you have liberals and new Democrats competing for some of the same voters. Is there not potentially here a, a more troubling lesson to be drawn from that election for the federal election from the NDP's perspective? Well, it looks to me like we're going into the, uh, the summer period, which is the kind of like immediate lead up to the, the federal election campaign in what's shaping up to be uh, certainly a three-way race. Um, uh, so whether the right is united or not, they're certainly not in the lead in terms of uh, where things are right now. So there's a three-way race there. And, and as I said before, I think that this, uh, what's happened both in Quebec and in Alberta does off offer up that dynamic of being able to vote for what you believe in. And I find it instructive that in Alberta, when people were rejecting uh, a government, which I think is what is happening in Canada right now with the, with the, the, the um, federal conservative government, when people are ready to reject and to kind of uh, vote for a change, when they looked at who they were going to vote for, they had choices. And the, cho the choice that they made was for the progressive policies and leadership of the NDP. Right? So I think that that offers us a, a lot of hope for, uh, for the federal scene. And as I said earlier, I think the fact that there are clear differentiations for progressives, I mean, which is one of the issues that we're talking about here, for progressives, uh, if you want to vote for, for, for progressive change, I think that there are obvious uh, differences that would say that, that, that the NDP is the, is the logical and practical choice for progressives. Thank you very much. Well, let's open the discussion then to, to the floor. We're interested in your comments, your thoughts, your, uh, above all, really, your questions, more than speeches, but, but if you could put questions. <laughs> and you can indicate if you, I've, so I've got a bunch of hands coming up. I'll try to keep note of, of them and indicate who you're asking the question to. Go ahead. My question has to do with the emerging grassroots organizations like LeadNow, um, .ca. Um, uh, some of us have said they are now going to jump in to the election. And uh, they aren't supporting any particular party. It's anyone that can defeat Harper. And I'm just wondering how you think or if you've thought about how that's going to affect the election, in particular, people who have uh, lost a good deal of trust in the major parties and uh, would rather um, pool together in individual writings um, behind organizations like Lead Now and some of us. Great. Uh, Anne, do you want to? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's a very positive sign that so many people want to get involved in the, I, I, at this. First, let me say, the stakes are high. Uh, we've had a decade of this government, and people do want to get rid of this government. And as I said earlier, I think that when you want to get rid of this government, you have to ask yourself what you want to replace it with. And uh, uh, I think you know, more and more Canadians are going to want to replace this government with, it, with something that will actually make a difference, where you will actually vote for something and it makes a difference, where a platform will be implemented. And as I said before, you know, childcare is a very good example. We've had promises of child care uh, for, for decades now, right? I mean, certainly I remember, uh, like, my, my children are, like, adults now, and uh, we were promised child care when, when they were little, well before that, actually. And I think that when you look at, you know, Quebec, when you look at Alberta, when you look at NDP governments, you can see this will happen. If you vote NDP, there will be a national child care program. 
think there was a question over here. Over here. Go ahead. Hi. Um, if you think you got it bad, I promised I'd move back to Alberta where I was born and bred. So. <laughs> Uh, Athabasca, sturgeon, red water. And my question is about in terms of in our past the first past the post system, there's no collegiality among the parties when they get there. There's committees that don't meet. Some provinces don't even seem to have committees. Um, and there's no public consultation. And when there is public consultation, it's ignored. And I think this is why a lot of younger people don't vote. But I'd like to ask the professor here and anyone else who wants to answer this, what is our government's, what's the Alberta government going to do about this process once we get in there? So will it change the tone of politics? Yes. Uh, will there be more cooperation among parties? Do you if I could just jump in just on uh, immediately on that, and, and I think that anybody who watched the swearing in of the cabinet will see <laughs> that just on a symbolic level, it was festival-like, there were children there in the waiting pool, there were, uh, there, it was a, a beautiful atmosphere, it was open, it was welcoming, it was a swearing in for the people. And I think that that approach is, that, that just that alone, I think, indicates a massive change in, in politics. I've never seen anything like that anywhere. So that, and I think that that will be translated into other things, and I know uh, that, that, that uh, Premier Notley and her cabinet colleagues feel very strongly that, that they need to be able to communicate with other parties, that they need to have the public involved, and so I think that there will be changes like that in, in Alberta for sure. There is, a, there is a sense that our politics have become too adversarial. Uh, the level of partisanship uh, has reached a sort of level of toxicity that's turning off voters. Do any others want to respond to whether there are any lessons here? Well, I certainly will jump in, and, and, and it is very adversarial. Um, quite frankly, it's, it's downright mean. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and, and this is part of the problem with party politics. I'd love a system where you actually didn't have to be identified with any party and you actually got voted in because you were the right person for the right job. It's just not the way our system works. I, it's also interesting that we're having this conversation because Rachel Notley is going gonna, is gonna to face same, some of the similar problems that the PCs did. And we, and we saw that with the swearing-in. You're absolutely right. The dynamics of the swearing-in were far different. But what's, what also happened there was her, her first major food bar of the incident is, is she literally put out a donation request attached to the government swearing in of MLAs that is 100% illegal and not allowed. Um, admittedly, after a day, took it down, but that should never happen. So those kind of things happen. Also, we saw uh, David Swan and Greg Clark and Deb Drever be sworn in confidentially at the Lieutenant Governor's office um, with no media. Why are not all MLAs sworn in together? It, you know, I appreciate some of the tone has changed, but when you become into power, um, there's a certain tone you keep as well. And we've already seen two incidences where, where the government has, A, made a pretty major mistake um, by adding donations data and data collection under um, taxpayer dime, but more importantly, that you're swearing in MLAs with no media and, and no ability to do it as a whole group, and we were all elected under the same banner. So those are the first two starts. Do I think that's going to continue? No, I think there is a new attitude. My personal relationship with Ms. Notley and the NDPs when I was in opposition was very, very positive. And when, when you can have the Wild Rose and the NDP working together on healthcare issues, that's pretty dynamic. So I think there's lots of room there, but let's not assume that it's all unicorns and rainbows yet. <laughs> can I just declare my uh, support for the first past the post system? <laughs> um, you know, uh, I think just on first past the post, uh, you know, everyone gets bent out of shape that the popular vote doesn't reflect the seats and so forth. But what, what our system allows is for leadership. And now Rachel Notley has four years to implement an agenda, for better or for worse. And, you know, somewhat uncompromised in her ability to do that subject to keeping the voters on side. She does, it's interesting to note that there is one MLA from the Alberta party and one from the there's a little, little old liberal left there in Alberta. So the NDP have to watch uh, the, the rear guard flank. You know, they, they've got, it's not just about the wild rules and conservatives. There's other places those votes can go. So I think that in itself is a moderating factor on how the government will probably operate. Question back here. Um, I think Carrie and Mike alluded to two things. Carrie, you mentioned the membership of the Wild Rose and where maybe some of the MLAs wanted to go and the membership didn't want the party to go there. 
And Mike, you mentioned that you know, when you're the premier, it's province first, party second. So I guess my question is, uh, and, and I, I'm from Quebec originally, so I remember uh, PQ leaders there, once they became premier, would say being premier is the easy job, being the party leader is really the tough job. <laughs> so perhaps you could tell us where do you see some of the tensions arising in the next four years between uh, Rachel Notley, the premier, and Rachel Notley, the leader of the uh, Alberta NDP, if any. Well, I'll, I'm happy to, to go first. Um, <laughs> um, I think Premier Notley has very similar challenges that Ms. Smith had in that she has a, a new dynamic party. She went from four to 53. Is it 53 or 54? 54. 54 seats. Um, she has a strong uh, labor movement involvement and also strong environmentalist in involvement. She has some young MLAs that are ideologues. And there's nothing wrong with all of those things. But it's like herding cats. And everybody will believe that they have as much as possible to bring to the table. I think that's part of the reason why she picked a small cabinet, so that she can control some of those conversations. She's going to have to do some pretty intense media training. Um, she's going to have to do some very intense social media um, um, reviews, because I guarantee it's not just one. There'll be more. Um, and, and the tensions are going to, there, there's going to be those tensions there of trying to create enough of those MLAs with the expertise to actually run government for a significant period of time, but also to fend off challenges to their next nominations, because that's always the next part of the problem. You are now in government. Everybody wants to run for the NDP. I might run for the NDP, I think, maybe. We'll see how it goes. Just joking. <laughs> across the floor, might as well just keep on trucking. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, this is the problem once you get into government is you become the party everyone wants to be a part of. And trust me, there'll be some really great candidates and it's going to be hard. Do you keep the one you got or do you take this one and the profile and then federally as well? The, the dynamic also that, that uh, Ms. Notley is going to face is the dynamic within the Wild Rose. Because let's remember the Wild Rose's um, success as to date was very, very quick. Uh, up and coming. Brian Jean also had a personal story as well. Um, but again, you have 22 individuals who, who came out of the, the swell of a betrayal who all believe that they can take this province again. You know, we're the, 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 the soldiers in the march. Lost votes. But you also have a, a, a leader for now. Uh, Drew Barnes lost. Um, so I, I, do we honestly believe that Drew Barnes doesn't want to ever be leader? No. <laughs> Um, you have Derek Fildebrandt, a powerful activist with the Canadian Taxpayer Federation who's used to being a long and, and, and strong voice in the Wild Earth. So she's also going to have that dynamic. And then where, where does the center go? So you have a right-wing party, you have a left-wing party, but where do conservatives like me, who don't necessarily have a home today, we got nine PC MLAs, where you just sit in the middle and you wait for what to happen. So that's where I see the challenges, and, and they're vast, absolutely. So I'm, I think we have a question over here, yeah. Hello, is this working? Yeah, okay. Um, I have a question also related to the voting system, as was kind of mentioned earlier. Um, so it seems to me that something really important in Alberta's win for the NDP was that it's first past the post. Um, I saw some data indicating that if it had been proportional representation, um, the NDP would not have won by nearly as many seats. So, um, and I guess the other piece of that is that often especially for progressives federally, we feel split between Liberal and NDP. Um, so you feel like you have to vote for whoever's most likely to win, given that it's first past the post. Um, personally, I think proportional representation is a lot more fair. It doesn't waste all of those votes. And I know that the federal NDP has also promised to implement proportional representation if elected. So I guess I'm wondering if anyone has further thoughts on um, how having first past the post played into the election in Alberta and what that might um, if there's any implications from that for moving forward federally. So, Mike, you haven't persuaded everyone. <laughs> um, well, how would you feel if uh, the PCs, and, okay, so the NDP got 40% of the vote in Alberta. How would you feel if uh, the PCs and Wild Rose formed a coalition and governed? That would be proportional representation. So, um, anyways, that's what I'll leave it on that point. 
And can I just say, because I mean, the federal NDP does have a position in, in support, obviously, of proportional representation. But but if I could just say on this idea of, uh, you know, you vote if you want to get rid of the conservatives, do you vote for the one that you think is most likely to uh, defeat? Well, recent history would indicate that nobody can predict that. I mean, nobody can predict the outcome of an election. So that's why I think our argument has to be, vote for the change you want. Don't vote for who you think is gonna defeat the Conservatives, because you can't predict that. You don't know what's gonna happen. Quebec tells you that, Alberta tells you that. I think you vote for what you, what you believe in. A question here. I have a bit more of a comment about context. I relate to Jerry's point that you didn't run on raising royalties, but I, I happened to sit on a board with Peter Lougheed for a number of years after he left politics, and he would quietly despair about what had happened to his legacy, the Heritage Fund. And um, he talked about it quietly. And uh, because of him, I started looking up some research, and there was a study done by the Alberta Chamber of Commerce in 2006 with a preface by him saying, where's the money gone? There was another one in Alberta, the, I think it was the Calgary Chamber of Commerce, about 2011, 2012, saying, where's the money gone? They're pointing out that Alberta had about, what, at $16 billion in their heritage fund, which is what it, what it had when Peter Lougheed was there. Alaska, under Sarah Palin, had $38 billion in their heritage fund. By that stage, Norway, with pumping out less oil than, than, than Alberta, had $300 billion in their heritage fund. Today it has $1 trillion in their heritage fund. And where's Alberta? $16 billion in their heritage fund. They lost all the reserve flexibility that they would have had if Peter Lougheed had stayed in with his system. So they, they blew all that in terms of context. So yes, you had the election. It was a, tr it was a difficult situation. But they lost all their leverage and all their room. So if she brings about a professional review of the royalties, I'm quite certain that she will be able to demonstrate that they can get closer to what Sarah Palin did <laughs> or, or what the Norwegians did. And hopefully in four years, if she does that in a sophisticated way, the way a red Tory called Peter Law, he did it, we might be here celebrating the re-election of a, of a Sarah Notley government, or Rachel Notley government. <laughs> the Sarah <laughs> forgetting that. I mean, th this was a huge issue. I mean, people there in Alberta were very, very frustrated by the issues this gentleman raises. And uh, uh, it, it, it was palpable anger, frustration, impatience. I mean, people had seen uh, oil prices when they're high, and nobody would talk about royalties. Nobody would talk about value-added processing within the PCs, within the industry. And when they're low, it was the same thing. And it reminded me of some of the debates in the 70s and 80s and 90s about BC forestry, where nothing could be changed when prices were high, and nothing can be changed when prices are low. And it doesn't work when prices are high, and it doesn't work when prices are low, but nothing can be changed. And that, that, it was a deadlock in, in Alberta, and that, that, that deadlock has been broken, and there will be a debate. The numbers will be made public. The issues will be driven by the Notley government, and uh, we'll see where it goes. And when oil prices are low, obviously, it's a tougher environment to extract more revenue. And I think that realism will be there, but there'll also be some honesty and, a, and a, an insistence on a public debate that has been missing for a long time. All right, question over here. Hi, I see a lot of similarities here in BC and what, what happened in the Alberta election. We're seeing cutbacks in education, if you saw the paper this morning. We're seeing cutbacks to seniors, we're seeing cutbacks in everything. We don't have the $15 an hour minimum wage, even though prices continue to go up. And my biggest concern, however, is Canadian sovereignty. And I'm seeing this government, NBC, selling off 
private, selling off public lands, selling off public resources at bargain basement prices like BC Rail to pay for p political party mess ups. And I'd like to know if there's a plan with any of the parties to start putting some limits on what we're going to sell off in this country because I see our oil, I see our railways, everything is being sold off to multinational corporations. We have no say in the kind of economy we're going to have in the future. We are always jumping, and this is historical, we're always jumping on resource extraction because we can make a big buck no matter how dirty this country becomes, whether we turn it into a toilet. I think it's time to take the money from the oil companies, start putting it into green energy, and start quit building these highways. I mean, we, we had a referendum to, to go for transit, clean transit. Everybody was excited. What happens the day that the vote is due in, the money's not going there. It's going for bridges, highways, and more cars for the oil companies. Thank you very much. So <laughs> clean energy, <laughs> diversification, sovereignty, extraction. Uh, you, you, I guess pick what part of that you want to respond to. <laughs> 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 Where does one start? Yeah, this exactly. is why you need social democracy, Matt. <laughs> vote, my, my answer to that is in October, vote NDP. <laughs> and may want to comment further. As always, I agree with Jerry. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Sorry, we've got the microphone. There's this gentleman's. Oh, sorry. All right, so why don't we just take a couple more questions? I know uh, Ian and I think Bill wanted to, and we'll, so we'll just do those three and then, then wrap. Hi. Two more. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I have a question about demographics. Um, uh, someone mentioned that eight, in the 18 to 34 uh, demographic, we had 75% of the usual turnout, and over 55, 125%. And one thing I found I was canvassing in Calgary was that. Uh, Absolutely, we were making breakthroughs with older voters that were turning on to the NDP for the first time. And I would ask, how do we advance that? And how do we engage older voters in BC? Um, and I'm curious to know uh, everyone's thoughts on that. Well, if I could just, I, I can't sort of comment specifically on British Columbia, but I can say that I think that we are, uh, certainly at the federal level, have been making some advances with uh, older Canadians. And in particular, again, if I could relate it back to this whole issue of, of what are the policies, what, are the, what, is, what is your offer to Canadians, the fact that we've been so clear that, uh, that, that we're going to, you know, put the retirement age back from 67 back to 65, that we're going to support the doubling of the CPP, that we're going to increase the OAS uh, and, and, and GIS, all of those kinds of policies that when, uh, for instance, the Canadian Association of Retired People does regular um, research and points out that, uh, that, that for the most part amongst their membership, NDP policies resonate very strongly. And again, what the important thing there is, is that, that idea of connecting your values with your vote. So it's true that it's not necessarily reflected in the vote, but I think that's, that's the step that we need to make, is that connection of those values to that vote. Ian, real quick. Yeah, before I put a short question, I, I no, 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 on the night we remembered no, another Nazi, Grant Nazi, and they produced a great kid and, and, and a great party. So let's remember it. Just a quick question to Jerry. What happened to the Liberals? He doesn't mean like, I don't yeah, mean the yeah. microphone. <laughs> what happened? No, but for the live streaming. What, what, for the happened, live streaming. what happened to the... Do you want my yeah, music for the live streaming? Yeah. Yeah. All right, Just take one. The question to Jerry and maybe others: What happened to the Liberal Party in uh, in Alberta? And also, what what about the mayors of Nemshi and the mayor of Calgary? And I'm not sure the mayor of Edmonton. What role, if any, did they play? Well, just quickly, the Liberals in Alberta um, have been at times a very important force, uh, and and over the years, and Carrie and and Anne from both from Alberta could comment more on this. I know, uh, and that. That, that has gone up and down a bit, but very important. 
and in the last 15 years, I'd say they got a lot more votes than the NDP. In 2012, both the NDP and the Liberals were between 9 and 10 percent of the popular vote. The Liberals got one more seat by a couple because of a couple hundred vote difference, but they they just didn't get going in the last couple of years, and the Liberal leader. Uh, wasn't seen as particularly effective. He left the Conservatives to become Liberal leader and never quite figured that out uh, and, then, and then resigned in March. And they never found their footing in this period and failed completely after the Wild Rose uh, movement to the Conservatives to fill the vacuum of, of who is going to be the alternative to the PCs. And as I said earlier, Rachel Notley filled that vacuum rapidly and effectively and left the, the Liberals in the dust, really, because they were not prepared in any way to take on the role that Wild Rose had filled as, as a very effective opposition uh, prior to 2012 in particular. So it was a, it was a rather rapid decline. but but came about, I think, because of a very shaky foundation following the 2012 election. Um, in terms of the mayors, uh, neither one of them took partisan positions, uh, but both the mayor of Edmonton and the mayor of Calgary uh, commented uh, on public affairs in a way that I think helped to highlight, in a very nonpartisan way, some of the failings of the PC government in addressing the urban issues and, and uh, in both Edmonton, Calgary, but also in other major urban centers, Lethbridge, Red Deer, Grand Prairie and so on, the, the PCs just weren't moving to address emerging urban issues, whether it was in housing or transit and, and uh, rapid growth that meant lotteries to send your kids to school. They, and so the mayors didn't get involved, but, but made it clear that improvements were needed. And it turns out that our platform reflected those improvements, whereas the PC budget did not. Can Thank I just you. add one thing to that? Okay. The other thing that I would add to that is what we saw last year, a year and a half ago, was the, um, the, the new relationship with councils. What we saw across Alberta was brand new mayors and councils that were under the age of 40. Our major cities went to, to mayors that were under the age of 40 who were really dynamic. And the Liberals never ever looked at that as an opportunity. And I think that that's where the Alberta party thought they would gain some ground. They failed to do that as well. But in, in the election of, of or, or the picking of David Swan as the interim leader for the Le Liberals, that was pretty much the nail in the coffin for the Liberals. I think they, you know, with, with Darshan Kang leaving and Kent Hare leaving to run federally, um, everyone thought Lori Blakeman was, was a given. That clearly wasn't the case. She, she lost in the NDP wave as well. And, and really, um, Emma, Emma Swan, uh, the leader of the Liberals, really just hung on to his seats because of who he is, not because he's the Liberal leader. Well, I wanted to take another question, but I'm afraid we've got to close it right there. We're right at the end of our time, so I'd like to uh, uh, ask uh, you to join me in welcoming Doug MacArthur. To the Hi there. I'm, I'm, Doug, I'm Doug MacArthur. I'm the director of the School of Public Policy here at uh, Simon Fraser University. Uh, we're the foremost public policy school across the country. Our graduates. Uh, take jobs with governments, including new progressive governments, and so we're looking forward to seeing <laughs> our many master students moving westward uh, to take advantage of a new opportunity that's arisen. Uh, in my job, it's fall fallen to me to say thank yous and to just briefly sum up. Uh, let me first of all, uh, as the co-sponsor of this event, thank the Broadbent Institute and for a wonderful partnership in putting together this event, and it's been a great success, I think you'll all agree. And to uh, thank Stratcom, and to thank QP, and to thank the um, uh, Institute for the Human Humanities here at Simon Fraser University for, for their support. <clears throat> I also want to thank the panelists. I think we can all agree uh, that they did a knock-up job, including the tremendous moderating done by our friend Max from the University of British Columbia. We don't speak too often here about uh, that place, but <laughs> we do, we do draw, periodically draw upon some of the very best from there. And Max, we see you in that light. So thank you very much. Thank you, all of you on the panel, for, uh, for what you did. 
just, just in summing up, I think there's, uh, the question is, uh, what can we learn, uh, and uh, what is the significance of the Alberta election? Uh, one thing I think we learned from this panel is that uh, political organizers and activists don't necessarily stop spinning after the election is over. <laughs> <coughs> However, that's, uh, that's nevertheless informative. Um, I, was, uh, I couldn't help but thinking about uh, the, uh, the, uh, when uh, Chao Enlai, the former now deceased premier of China, uh, was asked what was the significance, Mr. Premier, of the French Revolution, which we know was in the last decade in the 1700s. And he sat back and he said, well, it's just too early to tell. Uh, <laughs> and uh, perhaps we'll be struggling on what happened here. I'm from Saskatchewan originally, worked for many years in Saskatchewan. It was a favorite industry of academics to puzzle over why, with similar conditions in the 1920s and 1930s, similar populations, similar geographic conditions, similar economy, Alberta went one direction and Saskatchewan went the other. Alberta went right-wing, conservative, and stayed that way, and Saskatchewan went strongly NDP, social democratic, and stayed that way for a very long time. And uh, after a lot of publications, a lot of research, a lot of work, uh, generally speaking, I think this conclusion was there was just different political cultures. Uh, and then, suddenly, over the last three or four years, somebody pulled the big switcheroo. Uh, and, and now we've got to puzzle why Saskatchewan is voting, in, uh, voting conservative and why um, Alberta is voting NDP. But you've closed the, the link here now, so we've got another 60 years of research work that we can now proceed with uh, tr tr trying to solve this, this, qu this question. Um, as to... Uh, what we, what we heard here today, I think we can say that we heard uh, that the Conservatives, the PCs, self-destructed. That seems fairly obvious. We've heard that the uh, Wild Rose went through a rather bad crumbling and then made a recovery and that is c during the campaign and just prior to the campaign, and that significantly affected the results. We heard that the NDP had a message and a program that touched a lot of ordinary people and was compassionate and signaled the right kind of sense of feeling and values. We've heard that the NDP uh, exceeded expectations, and that, that was an advantage to them. And leadership, that, uh, that, uh, that the leader of the NDP stood out as a uh, convincing leader, and those are all important things. And that the campaign, although we didn't hear so much about that, but I, I just, uh, campaigns matter. We learned that in, Sus in BC, we've learned that in Alberta as well. We didn't hear so much about the people per se as we did about the parties, but I think we can nuance out some of what was said. Uh, people were fed up. Uh, people believed that things could be different. Uh, people had still had hope for possibilities and for better things in Alberta, whereas the governing party seemed to be negative and seemed to be offering nothing but a message of hopelessness. And so the people did what they do. They voted for a party that represented what they wanted to see happen. And that is perhaps the, the best final word on this. The people spoke and the people, people asked for this and they got what they wanted. And now it's up to the Notley government to deliver those goods. I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for your questions. Uh, and, uh, and look forward to seeing you here again at Simon Fraser University. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon.